Hello, we're continuing our study in Exodus. We've just finished the Ten Commandments, and now we're beginning in chapter 20, verse 18, which really forms a literary unit all the way through chapter 23. So chapter 20, verse 18, through chapter 23, verse 33, is often called the Book of the Covenant. Now, we get that name from chapter 24, verse 7. There's some scholarly disagreement of whether we're referring to the Ten Commandments and this, this uh, legislation we're going to study today or just this legislation we're going to study today. And, and I'm not sure which, but usually 2018 through 2333 is considered a literary unit. Now, it's a, it's a summary of various laws, both religious and civic, some criminal, uh, some civil in nature. And it's very hard to outline, but it's, uh, it is purported to be given by God to Moses uh, on Mount Sinai, and in chapter 24, 7, he is told to write them down. Now, it is, it is uh, significant that these laws have much in common with un other uh, ancient Near Eastern law codes, and yet they are as unique as they are similar. In the Hebrew legislation, the um, value of the individual is emphasized over the value of property, which is emphasized in other ancient law codes. And also, in the Hebrew legislation, the responsibility for our acts is taken into account. So motives and attitudes are, as, are significant in this legal terminology. Um, it is also significant to me that verses 18 through 21 is very similar to Exodus 19, verses 16 through 25. Now, that's where they come before the mountain and the mountain quakes and God's glory comes down. So it's like that we're repeating this brief introduction to show it's another set of laws distinct from the ten words. And so it's like, a, a, it's like an introductory formula saying here are some more laws that God gave at Mount Sinai. And I believe that that's what it is like. So let's look then, if we could... Um, Notice in verse 19, the people are afraid. Now, it is a good they're afraid. Notice that the fear mentioned in verse 19, lest we die, they were afraid to see a holy God because they recognized their own sinfulness uh, and they were, they were afraid. But notice in verse 20, there is a purpose for fear and that purpose is in order that we may fear him, uh, the fear of him may remain with you that you may not sin. Uh, it's not that we're terrified of God, but there needs to be an awe, respect for God. And when we recognize that He is holy and He will bring His people as well as unbelievers into judgment, it is a deterrence for sin. So there is some a healthy fear in the Christian faith, and I think we need to see that. Now, notice in verse 21, it mentions this thick cloud where God was. Now, this is, the rabbis call this the Shekinah glory from the Hebrew verb to dwell. It symbolized the presence of God. We see it first in chapter 13, verse 22. We see it again in chapter 14, verse 19, and then in chapter 19, verses 9 through 16. It was a way to symbolize the presence and power of God during this wilderness wandering uh, period. Now, beginning in verse 22. Um, and notice it says, I have spoken to you from heaven, God says to Moses. What a great honor it is for God to reveal himself to the Hebrew people. It reminds me a whole lot of Hebrews chapter 1, verses three, 1 through 3, where it says, uh, God spoke in olden times in bits and pieces, but in our days he's spoken through a son. So the fact that God has spoken is the basic affirmation of the Christian faith. And that God has spoken clearly and truly in the Bible is the foundation for our understanding, not only of Jesus, but of all that's involved in Christianity. Notice in verse 23 it says, And you shall uh, not make other gods besides me. Now this word beside me kind of means in the same category. Uh, it's the same phrase used in, in, in the Ten Commandments, chapter 20, verse 3. I think God is saying, I am sui genus. There is nothing like me. I am the only God. So don't put anything else in, in the category of deity. I am the only one. So it is an uh, incipient form of uh, uh, philosophical monotheism. And for all practical purposes, it is practical monotheism for the Hebrew people. Uh, notice it mentions there in verse 24 that they're to do an altar of earth. And down in verse 25, if you make it an altar of stone, it shall be uncut stones. Now, this uh, altar of, of, of earth and uncut stones it is very similar to the uh, very uh, quickly put together altar sites of nomadic people. 
Now, this is very significant because it implies, without a lot of description, of what they are to sacrifice, which seems to imply that sacrifice is much older than this. They understood what it was, didn't have to explain it, and that they're to do it in a way where they can place an altar here, worship God, and then move on. It's a more of a nomadic existence. Now, notice in verse 24 where it says, burnt offerings and peace offerings. Now, burnt offerings are discussed in detail in Leviticus 1, verses 3 through 17. It's wholly consumed on the altar. Peace offerings are discussed in Leviticus 3, 1 through 17, and they're more of a communal variety. Uh, the man gets part of the offering back. He eats it with his friends in the holy area. God symbolically dwells with him. In my opinion, Revelation 3.20 is this kind of fellowship meal. The Lord's Supper is a later development of this kind of fellowship meal. And these are the two primary offerings that are discussed here. Others will be mentioned in, in the first few chapters of Leviticus, but these are the two original ones. Notice it says, your sheep and your oxen. For a desert community, their animals were very precious to them. They did not eat them at all, hardly, except for very special occasions. So to sacrifice to God the best they had, which is, I think is the spiritual truth for what we are to give to God. Now, notice it mentions here, where I call, in every place where I cause my name to be remembered. Now, originally, this probably referred to patriarchal sites where God had spoken to the patriarchs, like Bethel and places like that. Uh, later on, uh, it referred to the places where the tabernacle uh, rested, uh, Gilgal, uh, Shechem, uh, Shiloh, uh, those kinds of places. And finally, in the book of Deuteronomy, we know it focuses in on the city of Jerusalem. And you might want to see for that 1 Kings 8, 16 and 29. Uh, this same emphasis of place where God will call you to dwell is a, one of the characteristics of the book of Deuteronomy. You might want to see Deuteronomy 12, 5, 11, 18, and Deuteronomy 26, 2. It's a very, uh, matter of fact, much of the, the flavor of Deuteronomy uh, comes from these earlier uh, books of the Torah because really Deuteronomy is a summary of all the Torah. Now, notice if you would where it says, and do not build with them with cut stones. Now, why that? Well, it must be important because it's mentioned two other times, Deuteronomy 27, 5 and 6, and Joshua 8, 31. Some say it's to speak of the simplicity of worship. That is, if man tries to have some ornate altar like the Canaanites did, that that was a violation of making representations of heaven. And I think it's, whether we understand fully the extent, much of these laws were written in reaction to Canaanite pagan uh, worship. And so it obviously has to do something against the elaborate altars of the Canaanites. Uh, Notice it, it says in verse 26, You shall not go up to steps to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed on this. Now this again it reflects the pagan worship, uh, particularly the fertility cult, which often had their priests uh, uh, naked before their god. God says that's not right. Uh, they wore skirts in those days, and, and uh, this is a euphemism for the sex organs. And so what it's saying is you need to be modest in your worship of me. And I think that's a, a, a good universal principle. We're not saying we have to all wear 500, a uh, botany 500 suits, but it is saying we need to dress up in an appropriate, uh, modest ways when we approach God in worship. And I, I think uh, that's uh, very uh, helpful. Uh, let's see. By the way, it's interesting that in the, the golden calf experience that Aaron made in Exodus 22, both of these are violated. Not only the the no graven image and the fancy altar, but also the nakedness. There was a, an orgy that took place at that same account. So the, you see why these laws were given. Now chapter 21. Now these are the ordinances we shall set before them. If you buy a Hebrew slave. Now slavery is assumed in the Bible. It was part and parcel of the ancient world. The Bible does not condemn slavery. It works within the system of slavery. Now I hope you understand what that means. This seems to be somewhat negative in our day, but in its own day it's very positive because it puts some control on the rights of masters. We see the same thing in Roman day in, as Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter 6 uh, verses um, 6 through 9. Now this is positive because it, it, it ad admonishes the masters to have an appropriate attitude. Now the discussion of Hebrew slaves is found here in chapter 1 but it's also found in Leviticus 25 39 through 43 and Deuteronomy 15 12 through 18. And so it is the discussion here. Alien slaves are discussed in Leviticus 25, 44 through 46, and it's a different set of laws. So here we see a distinction between a covenant partner, how we're to treat him, and foreigners. Now notice that if you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve you six years, and the seventh year he shall go as a free man without payment. Now this is the same kind of cycle in years as the weekday worship cycle. Uh, we know that this, this uh, seventh year was a year of release. If the year of Jubilee happened to come sooner, they would be released then, and we find that in Leviticus 23, 
uh, I believe it's 2540. I can't read my own writing. The year of Jubilee would also set them free. So a Hebrew would, would have to sell himself for poverty or because he commit, had an accident, had a, a judgment against him or whatever reason, but he would be his only an indentured servant and would be released the seventh year. Now, back in, in uh, Deuteronomy 15, 43 and 44, here it says he's to go out with nothing. That's what verse 3 means. The word alone means with his back, meaning not even the shirt on the back. He, he goes out with nothing. But in Deuteronomy 15, 43 and 44, the Hebrew master is admonished to send him out as a brother, help him get started. And so I think there's a beautiful balance here. The word free man is a class in society between a slave and a nobleman. So it's, it's, a, it's a term for a class designation. Notice if you would down in verse... Um, Oh, five and six, we're talking about voluntary servitude. If a man comes in and, he, and, and the master gives him a wife, the wife and children belong to the master. If the man really loves his family and wants to stay, he can do that. And he goes through this ritual here of putting a hole through his ear, uh, probably in the door of the house where he's going to be attached. That may be the symbol here. And he becomes a permanent slave at, at his choice, a Hebrew. This is also in Deuteronomy 15, 16, and 17. Notice now in verses 8 and 9, we have the rights of concubine Hebrew women, women who are sold. This is a common custom. It sounds somewhat gross to us, but uh, it was the normal thing. Daughters were sold, uh, sometimes very young. They were sold for the concubine, to be a concubine of the owner or maybe to be raised up in the family and be an owner's son. They had certain rights. God protected them. They couldn't be used and abused and then cast away. And here in verses 8 and 9, we see some of the rights. In verse 10, we have the idea that you can't reduce her food, her clothing, or her conjugal rights. Now, what does that mean? Well, the Hebrew word here is somewhat uncertain, and we can't be exactly of its meaning. But it may mean that uh, she can't be denied the uh, sexual um, attention of the man. This is what seems to be in 1 Corinthians 7 verses 3 and 5 in Genesis 2:24. Uh, marriage evolved in becoming two flesh, that this mutual coming together in sexual union uh, meant that our bodies don't belong to ourselves, they belong to our partner. And so there is a mutual responsibility of give and take. And that's true in any marriage, even in these concubine relationships, there was still rights and privileges that belong to these semi-official uh, wives. Notice in verse 12, down through several verses, and really for the next two chapters, we talk about the death penalty. Uh, there wasn't a law for everything in this desert society, but what there was a law against, many times it was the death penalty. They didn't have a lot of little nitpicking rules, but what they said, they meant. And so in verses 12, in verse 14, in verse 15, in verse 17, in verse 23, in verse 29, chapter 22, verses 18, 19, and 20, we see the death penalty, capital punishment, is imposed. Notice verse 12. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. Now, friend, if you'll go down to verse 23 with me, this is eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth language. You see verses, 22, verses 23 and 24. Uh, this very famous Old Testament law is also repeated in Leviticus 24, 17 through 22, and Deuteronomy 19, 21. It sounds rather harsh to us, but reality it was a way to limit revenge. If someone knocked out your brother's eye, you'd go kill three of his family was the way it was done, blood feuds. This was to limit the revenge and was a step up in the understanding of the relationship between the tribes. Notice verse 13, if he did not lie in wait for him. Now here's the idea that there, if you kill somebody, there's a difference between premeditated murder and accidental murder or a, a, a passion or overreaction in the moment. And the idea is made here between men fighting with their fist or with some weapon they just happen to pick up. And there's a distinction made between motive and the penalty, and I think that's very important. Also, we're introduced here to the cities of refuge where a man may flee if he accidentally kills somebody uh, from the relatives of the dead man. We see this spelled out in Numbers 35, Deuteronomy 19, and Joshua 20, and you might want to read those parallel passages for more about the city of refuge. Notice in... Uh, in verse 14, about uh, taking it even from the altar. The altar had horns on the sacrificial altar. A man could grab those horns, and that was the holiest place of safety. But if he was guilty of murder, he could be taken even from the horns of the altar and killed. You might want to see 1 Kings 1.50 and 1 Kings 2.28 for a historical example of this very thing. Uh, then in verse 14, we, uh, verse, excuse me, verse 15, we talk about a person who uh, strikes his father or mother. Now, it, the act in verse 15 and then down in verse 17 is the thought, one who curses his father and mother. In a patriarchal society, the family relationship was very important 
I often kid my teenagers, if we just stoned a few of them, it would really stop sassing. <laughs> well, in this society, if you struck your parent or talked back to them, you could be stoned. Now, I'm not sure it happened that, that often, but it could happen. And you might want to see Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21 for a parallel. And the verbal abuse is also found in Leviticus 20, verse 9. Now, notice if you would where it mentions here um, kidnapping in verse 16. Many of us believe that kidnapping refers to thou shalt not steal of the Ten Commandments refers to this, but that, that's somewhat uncertain. In verse 18 is the word fist, and that comes from the Septuagint and the Vulgate translation, but the Hebrew word probably means or possibly means shovel or some weapon at hand, not a premeditated act of murder. By the way, the sacrificial system of the Old Testament was for unintentional sins. Intentional sins were not covered by the sacrificial system. Even the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16 did not cover premeditated sins. That's why David in Psalm 51 could not offer a sacrifice. Now skip down with me if you would. We're beginning to be, talk about property in verse 20. Uh, and here we see that um, a, a, a slave was considered to be property. And we understand that that's the, the day in which it was written. But I want you to notice that the uh, treatment, uh, appropriate treatment, humane treatment is emphasized, um, Let's see, in Leviticus 25, 43, and you might want to see that parallel. Now, in verse 22, it talks about a woman who gets involved between the fight between two men, and she's pregnant, and there's, a, there's some, some kind of miscarriage here. Now, the wording is somewhat ambiguous, but I want to say this to you. Some use this to say that, see, uh, the, the death of a fetus is not as important as the death of a person who's older. That is not true. The miscarriage here is, it literally it means the children come out. So it's like a woman who's very pregnant is hit, and she has a premature birth. If the child comes out alive and well, there's no further problem with the man who hit her. If the child dies, then look at verse 23. It's life for life again at Leviticus 24, 17 through 22 and 19, Deuteronomy 19, 21. Eye for an eye to, if the baby dies, the one who hit the woman dies. And I think abortion is a horrendous problem. It's a cultural disgrace and you can't back it up on a verse like this. Uh, now, notice if you would, if we go down to uh, verse 28, talking about an ox that gores someone. If it gores someone and kills them, the flesh can't be eaten. Now, why is that? It goes back to Genesis 9, 5, because there was this blood guiltiness uh, that came to the animal because it shed human blood. And so, therefore, it was, it was sinful and it could not be eaten. I know that sounds ridiculous to us. There's a distinction here made between an ox that gored the first time and an ox that gored all the time. The man was responsible to take care of an animal that was known to gore people. And if the, the second time, he was responsible for the life. And I think that's very important. We see that. Notice in verse 32 is the price of a slave, 30 shekels of silver if it was, was killed. Now, this is very important because of its use in Messianic prophecy, particularly Zechariah 11:12, and its fulfillment in Judas receiving 30 pieces of silver for betraying Christ, Matthew 26, 15. So Judas was selling Jesus for the price of a slave. I've got to go through this faster. I've run out of time. Notice in chapter 22, then, we have the rights of private ownership. And we also see the high price of restitution for a, a, a crime against either a criminal or civil. And that's something we've forgotten. Just to say, oh, I'm sorry, God, is not enough. The Old Testament teaches that restitution, is, if it's possible, should be done. And there's a high price to be paid for restitution. Uh, notice it mentions here um, in verse 2 and 3, and notice we have an example of a thief. Now, in verse 2, if you catch a man at night breaking in your house, you're, you have the right to kill him to protect yourself because you can't see, you don't know who he is, don't know what his purpose is. You could kill a thief at night. But look at verse 3. If it's daylight, you're going to recognize the man. You can call for help. If you kill him in daylight, you're responsible. Notice the distinction here between motives and circumstances, a very unique element in the ancient law code. Uh, notice if you would, a property is talked about in verse 5. Hebrew word here to graze, bear. Some translations say burn. Uh, the Hebrew word means both, and it's very hard to know which uh, distinction we're making. The thorn bushes of verse 6 was the boundary they put around fields to keep animals in or humans out or vice versa. So here's the responsibility uh, in, in an agricultural sense. Uh, notice here in verse 9 it says, For every breach of trust, whether it's an ox or a donkey. Now this uh, breach of trust is a word that means known rebellion. So we're talking about people abusing other people's property. So the Old Testament uh, seems to advocate the uh, right to have property and the responsibility within the community to protect each other's property. 
Uh, notice in verse 10 about uh, if someone says you lost my animal, they're to take an oath before the Lord. Now, what's that for? Well, if you're lying, an oath is a very serious thing in God's name, and it was like a curse formula. If you lied before God, then God would, would, would punish you. And that's the idea here of taking an oath. That's why we used to take oaths in court. We used to swear to God we're telling the truth, though we don't do that uh, anymore. In verse 14 is an interesting verse. Uh, it talks about if a man borrows anything. This is the exact same word uh, used in Exodus 3.22 for the uh, people, the Hebrews borrowing from the Egyptians gold and silver. But again, the Hebrew word has two possible etymological connotations. One means to ask so as to borrow. One means to ask so as to have. The one in 3.22 is give me. The one here is borrow. And you might want to see 2 Kings 4.3 and 2 Kings 6.5 for an example of borrow. Notice it mentions about a woman here that's been seduced and she is not engaged. Now this seems horrible to us, uh, someone raping a person. Again, this is don't judge this culture in light of our own. If, if someone took a... a a, a virgin who was not engaged and they had sex with her, if they married her, it was all right. If she was engaged, that's a real problem because engagement was kind of like already being married and then the death penalty occurred if, if that happened. Uh, you know, we'll see Deuteronomy 22, 23, and 24. The idea of a dowry here, it's mentioned several times in the Bible, but not too often. Deuteronomy 22, 28, and 29 says it's 50 shekels of silver. That's a pretty high price. Are they really buying the wife? No, they're buying the advantages that person had to a home. And so it's not like ownership, uh, but it is a very important thing in this society. Now, look at verse 18. You should not allow a sorcerer to live. You might want to see Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 13. This is the same word used for witchcraft, someone who tries to by magical means to control the future. Witches are to die. Look at verse 19. Uh, bestiality is a sin, uh, having sex relations with an animal, probably because that was done in the Canaanite fertility cults, and that's what made it so bad. Leviticus 18.23, Leviticus 20.15 20, and 16, Deuteronomy 27.21. And then also anybody who's an idolater, look at verse 20, uh, is put under the ban, means dedicated to God and should be killed. Deuteronomy 20.16 and 17, 1 Samuel 15.3, uh, the idea of idolater being uh, killed. And you see the three things that God hates here. Uh, now, in verses 21 through 27 is God's care for the poor, the ostracized, the needy, very characteristic of Deuteronomy. I don't have time to go through that. But I want you to notice in verse 25, it talks about lending money. It says, if you lend money to the poor, don't take any interest. And if you take security, give it back to them at night. So if we're going to help people by lending money, we need to do it with kindness and gentleness and understanding. And I think this is a, a word for our day when people are getting so ripped off by banks and loan sharks. This is a word if God's people are going to help God's people, they ought to do it because of God. God looked at the motive. God is watching. God will take care. In verses 28, 29, and 30, we have attitudes and actions of covenant people talked about. In verse 28, we're not to curse God. But really, if you'll see your notes, this should be judges. We shouldn't revile a judge or a ruler. Now, Paul quotes this in uh, Acts 23, 5. And, I think it's alluded to again in Romans 13, 1. God's in, God's in control. He puts people in authority. Uh, we shouldn't be cursing them. And also, we shouldn't uh, uh, delay in giving to God. Verses 29 and 30, we ought to tithe. We ought to give with a free heart. And then verse 31 is the positive part. We ought to be holy men before God. That goes back to Exodus 19, 5 and 6, where we're a kingdom of priests and God wants us to be holy. This is the New Testament through us that the goal of Christianity is not just heaven, but Christ likeness. And then chapter 23, verses 1 through 9, is basically about judicial fairness. No bribery. Uh, don't, uh, you know, abuse a poor man. Don't give favor to a rich man. Uh, and on and on. The word enemy in verse 4 uh, seems to be a leave, uh, your legal, a legal advocate, the person against you in court. But we are to act with love toward them. Verse 4 and 5 is very much like Matthew 5:44. Notice if we go down, uh, let's see, it talks about verse 10 and following. These are rest cycles of the land based on the theological content of Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. The, and the purpose of this rest is for the ox and the slave and, and all of that, the foreign-born person. So it's the ideal of resting or ceasing from labor. Notice that in verse 14 and following are the three feast days that every male Jew was to take a pilgrimage to the special holy place. Here the tabernacle, later on the temple. And the three are the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Here they're called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering. But those are the three it refers to. A complete list of all the feasts are given in Leviticus 23. Uh, now notice if you would, it mentions down in verse 19, 
this, this uh, strange little phrase, you are not to boil a kid in his mother's milk. There's been much discussion about that. This rule is mentioned in Deuteronomy 14.21. We don't know exactly what it means, but it's obviously against these Canaanite uh, uh, worship practices as we learn from the Ra Shamra text. Now in verses 20 and following, it talks about this special angel that will go before them. This angel seems to be talked about in chapter 14.19 and chapter 32.34. I believe it's the angel of the Lord or the pre-incarnate Christ. This is, can be particularly seen in verse 20. Notice we're to be on guard. There's a warning and a condition here. The warnings in verse 21, the conditions in verse 22. God's covenant will become operative if we keep his commandments. All of God's dealings with us are based on his initiating covenant love and our faith and repentant response. That's true here. The angel represents God. The angel will win their victories. The angel will go before them. Uh, and he will defeat the Canaanites. That's the idea here. In verse 24, it mentions the sacred pillars. Now, that's a symbol of the fertility worship of Canaan. If you'll look at chapter 34, verse 13, the female counterpart, Asturah, who is a pole by the side of this raised pillar, is brought in. It's fertility worship. It's to be destroyed. If they'll keep God's word and turn from these pagan worship practices, then God will give them the land. Notice how uh, the land is spelled out here. He won't do it all at once. He'll do it little by little. If you read the book of Joshua, it seems that everybody was defeated in the land of Canaan all at once. But if you read the book of Judges, it shows that the tribes had to do each in their own area the military mop-up campaign. So God will give them the fullness of the land if they'll believe him and turn away from these Canaanite practices. This fullness of the land only happened under David and Solomon. It never happened again because the Hebrew children did not keep the covenant. They did violate it, and it never became operative. Well, I've enjoyed being with you, and I'll see you again, same time, same place, next week. God bless you.